Our guests today are Hergita Ashley, a partner of Thompson Hine in Cleveland, and Jim Miller, who's Senior Managing Director of Alliance Advisors. He's based in Rockville, Maryland. Jim spent some time at ISS, was the Deputy Head of Research there. I'm Brock Romanek. We're going to talk some proxy advisor stuff today on Zippy Point. Brigitte and Jim, one of my favorite topics, and I don't know why, I think it's because it's so practical, but when you have to update or correct a proxy advisor report, you know, that's some of the secret sauce. That's something you don't learn in law school. You don't learn unless you've been in the field for a while. So let's start at the at the front of this, the basics. And Brigitte, how and for whom does ISS formulate its voting policies? What are, what are these voting policies? That's a great question, Brock. The vast majority of proxy advisors' clients are institutional investors. They engage proxy firms such as ISS and Glass-Lewis to simplify their voting processes and then usually heavily rely on their voting recommendations. It's important to remember that companies are generally not the clients and that these policies are not formulated for the benefit of companies. And I will now turn this over to Jim to talk about how ISS and Glass-Lewis formulates these policies. As with most companies, it's, it's important to note that ISS is a client-focused organization. But like as uh, Rita mentioned, that you know their their clients are the institutional investors, and uh, and so while many of us know that ISS supply applies specific policy frameworks created and selected by the institutional investors that are their clients, many, many of us don't understand how the policy development process works at ISS or at Glass-Lewis. Well, each year, ISS updates the US and global proxy guidelines for the upcoming year. What they do is ISS employs a top-down process, which is driven by feedback received from market per per participants through multiple channels. The market participants include, as your Gita mentioned, institutional investor clients of ISS, corporate issuers, and industry groups, while the channels used to compile the feedback consist of dialogue throughout the year from, from its investors and issuers, policy surveys, industry group roundtable discussions, and through an open comment period. Generally, ISS receives the input on corporate governance, environmental and social governance, and executive compensation. Typically, it begins its refinement process with an internal review of emerging issues, relevant regulatory changes, and notable trends seen across individual, regional, and global markets. Based on the feedback it receives throughout the year, but most, most notably that received from investors and companies during and after the proxy season, a proxy working group convenes and begins its examination of various governance and other voting topics across global markets. This usually occurs uh, in the fall, in the late summer to fall of the, of the calendar year. Academic research, empirical studies, and commentary by market participants also play a part of this process. Near the end of the process, after considering the feedback, ISS will post draft policy change proposals for the open review and comment period. The process culminates with the review of the final policy changes by ISS Global Policy Board and they approve it for the following year. That, in fact, as we tape this, that we are expecting um, the ISS uh, policy uh, changes for 2021 to be released uh, any week now. For most markets, updated policies are announced in November, usually mid-November to late November of each year, and they apply to meetings held or on or after February 1st of the following year but there are different timetables applied to a small number of markets that have off-cycle main proxy seasons. And Jim, how does it work if an investor, one of ISS's clients or someone from a company itself has a policy related question during the year? How does that work? How does that feedback work? work? Is the question that they're, are they allowed to ask questions or they have policy related? Yes, yes. Uh, in addition to the policy development process, kind of I guess went over in a kind of a 30,000 foot view, Issuers participate in surveys and outreach. They also utilize proxy advisor portals to request engagements, gain a better understanding of policies, or to highlight filings or other public resources that, that the advisors can use to, to prepare the reports and vote recommendations. 
However, it is, this is a fundamental, and you'll have you know, both proxy advisors are very firm on this, and it's, it's, it's actually a, a, one of the most important points. It is important to understand that ISS, Glass-Lewis, and, whatever, and who, all the other proxy advisors in general, they'll stop short of issuing advice in advance of the def definitive proxy filing or any other public filing respect to, with respect to any directionality of the vote recommendations based on these communications. So they might give you a general sense of what their policy is, but not how it applies to your specific facts until you have your proxy on file with the SEC. Yeah, and, and they, even then they'll, they'll uh, you know, until they see that the obvious public, publicly filed document, uh, they'll talk about, they'll point, they'll point the questions in, in, you know, in direction of where they can get the answers of their like FAQs and and um, but they won't they won't uh, you know front run a vote recommendation uh, uh, you know although that will be you know <laughs> obviously when during my experience you know sometimes people want to know and it's and it's it's difficult to say well you know well if we file an 8K will this change uh, in in everything well until you see the 8K what we discuss may sound like that would be yeah that would remedy the situation but until you actually see what the 8K says. Uh, or the filing, you really can't make any comments. So if they if they do make those filings, uh, and uh, and there is a change that will be that will be done in an alert, and we'll speak to that a little bit later. And you mentioned FAQs. Occasionally, I don't know if it's every year they do put out. Uh, ISS puts out a set of FAQs in early in the year about compensation related issues, but and sometimes they might also come out with a policy position that they didn't have in their initial. A voting policy updates later in the proxy season if something comes up that that sort of is a universal issue for a lot of companies. Well, kind of like the virtual meetings of this last year and and uh, all sorts of you know there, it, this was a, a, a really uh, uh, flagship year for for that type of that type of event but uh, I'm thinking on on, on terms of uh, uh, the the issue of virtual meetings and how that would be handled uh, whether or not uh, what the policy would be and what the policy would be going forward and whether or not, you know, like, you know, you know, were they going to um, uh, re retain their, 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 their more strict uh, policy on that, which is they generally prefer a hybrid meeting, which is uh, one that has a geographical location and, and uh, as well as a, a virtual meeting, or were they just be, would they be willing to just accept the virtual meetings on its, on its face? So that's an example of a situation where you had to act on the fly, given the uh, the changing circumstances that weren't available in the, the the fall season when the policies were being developed, and then we also have some very important pandemic related compensation FAQs that ISS came out. So I think every company, when it's preparing a proxy season proxy statement this season, should make sure to review those FAQs especially if it made adjustments to its compensation policies, cut compensation, change performance targets, did, did anything like that. It's worth the time to read those. Yeah, yeah those are very valuable. So Jim, can you break down for us how ISS and Glass Lewis prepare those voting reports for each specific company that they cover? Sure, and, and, what I, what I, and, and just to jump back on that, that last point I wanted to make is, uh, uh, even even if it wasn't a uh, a unique year, uh, uh, a one-off year, if you will, it, 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 at least from ISS and Glass Lewis perspective, it's it's important it's important to realize that they have that they have at least I know ISS has uh, applies some over 400 custom and specialty or thematic policies, and they're tailored to various market participants. And given that diversity of the client base, you know that includes you know various benchmark policies focused on on whether it's long-term shareholder value creation or best governance practice or a thematic policy, uh, it, it's not surprising that you're gonna get a lot of questions uh, that arise from, from various you know, institutions and various clients you know, during that policy development and application process. So you know, it, it, as part of a mitigation that ISS and Glass-Lewis, they interact with the company representatives, the, the institutions and their proponents and other parties to better understand the fact patterns. They, you know, to try, the, the goal is to try to gain a deeper insight into the key issues and then to, to enrich their analysis so that they can apply the, the policy in, in the vote recommendation uh, you know, appropriately. 
So now I'll, I'll I, I think I'll, 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 I'll transition to the, the question of like maybe granular on, on how, uh, how they, uh, uh, ISS prepare the research reports or, or what, uh, you know, Glass Lewis calls the proxy paper ISS, the, the research report, uh, same thing. It's a potato potato thing, but, uh, uh, now, while I can't speak for Glass Lewis directly for Glass Lewis, because uh, I'm most familiar with the process ISS used uh, and and use and uses, uh, I am confident that Glass Lewis uses a similar methodology and the sources. Uh, uh, very very confident on, on that. But it all starts with the information gained, you know, within the proxy statement, the definitive proxy statement as well as all other public information and interim events that, that transpired since the last report. Uh, so I'll walk you through the, the kind of the, the life of an analyst, I guess, at least for the, for the, for the season, uh, in the months preceding the season. So first, typically the, the proxy advisors uh, data team uh, will begin by updating its database with the latest information so that all those numerical and tabular and graphical information you see within each report, whether it's ISS or glass fluid, is current. Uh, this includes information about the directors, the board tables, executive compensation, uh, material company updates, shareholder rights, ESG scores, all the stuff. Okay, so that's a big job. And so that's one of the reasons why they it's imperative, you know, that, that earlier the definitive proxy statement relative, you know, uh, the, 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 the uh, more robust the report can be. And that's one of the reasons why yesteryear, and we'll talk about this, uh, you know, uh, later is that, that um, sometimes uh, S&P companies would not receive drafts if they, if they, if they filed their definitive proxy uh, within 30 days of the meeting. You might, I think of the report somewhat like a balance sheet, okay? You have a report, like last year's report, and, you know, balance sheet is, is uh, uh, I'm going to throw some points up, but that's part of my background, right? Uh, that it, it's, it's, it's kind of true on that date. It's that last year's report, boom, it was issued, and it's based on, on those factors. And then you have a whole bunch of interim events that happen between that year and this year. So the, the place to start off with is last year's report, and then you have to kind of walk through all of the subsequent things that happened during the year. There's a lot of 8K files, there's material company updates, there might be uh, directors that were resigned or retired, the new appointments, they might have had mergers, there's all of those things. So what are the things that the report's trying to do besides the proposals that are, that are put forth by management and uh, shareholders is also to give you a snapshot of kind of what the company looks like uh, in, you know, this year at this point in time as of the date the new report is issued. So it has to start, so the analyst would start with last year's report and, and it, would, it would kind of bring it forward. How does it do that? It, it's, we will, it would start by doing that, by, by, like I said, update the data. And uh, so you get the, uh, you know, some of the minor things like the, the, the director is another year old, if you, if you, you know, mentioning his age or, or so forth. But and more than that, it's then also to look at all of those 8K filings that are material, and then and then uh, put those in the material company updates. It's then when they do that, they then start looking at the the definitive proxy for what these proposals are and what were what were they were last year because you know a lot of the the proposals are the same director elections. Okay, they may change if you're a classified board, but but. A lot of the management proposals are similar and shareholder proposals may be there, they may not be there. So when the analyst is finished in a, in a when, when this is finished, when they apply the data, the analyst applies the relevant section of the latest proxy that pertains to those proposals to come with a vote, to come up with a vote recommendation based on their analysis and application of policy. The entire report then is given a top-down review and it's generally by seasoned analysts that include team specialists because some of the proposals will be corporate governance related. Others will be executive compensation related. Others might be environmental and social shareholder proposals. And some may be M&A related or economic related uh, and, you know, if, that, if, they're on, if they're on the annual meeting. So, so that's how I like to think of the, um, you know, how the, the if you will, how the analyst goes from the last year's report 
by utilizing the proxy and all the public information, whether it's on the websites or whether it's uh, the 8Ks and, and the 10Ks and, and all that to, to move over and create this year's report. And then, and that would be like the balance sheet date as of this year's date versus last year's date. And so the income statement, if you will, would be all the events that happen, uh, like when you have revenue and, and expense transactions and it changes the balance sheet figures because of the things that happen during the year. So that's kind of a, a view that I kept in my mind uh, uh, on it, so. Yeah, that's a great analogy, Jim. That's really useful. What about third party? Is it only company produce information that an ISS analyst will look at to formulate a, a research report to come up with the recommendation or will they look at like analyst reports or even industry uh, reports? Um, uh, they, 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 as you know, there's a lot of, there's, um, as far as the, what drives vote decision is, uh, is the, on the proposals, it's the policy, right? The governing policy. That said, the policy isn't always black and white, right? There's gray areas, right? There's, you know, it's weighing different factors. Uh, there are things that are, that are kind of speed limit driven, you know, overboarding, et cetera. But there's a lot of things that, or most things that actually are, you know, uh, weighing different factors and coming to a conclusion. Uh, and that's why, and one of the reasons is that the policy that's made by the, the ISS clients, they don't all uh, have the same opinions. Uh, it, just, they're not a lockstep, well, we all agree with that. In fact, many of them have their own, uh, the larger ones, and uh, ha have their own custom policies. They may agree with ISS, they may be more strict than ISS. Uh, or lenient. So uh, the, but as far as acting on third party uh, research, the, it's really the public company, the company's public filings, basically through the SEC, what's on the, com the company's West websites. Now, when contest contested situations, there will be, uh, on proxy fights and stuff, there will be uh, the M&A team or the special situations team is what it's called now, will review uh, different, uh, uh, more financial information than what some analyst reports and things from hedge funds, things from the company. But that's a whole different ball game than the the, the, the uncontested uh, annual meetings. Yeah, I love the name special situations. I always joke around with people when I'm giving them a task and I'm tell them they're they're now the head of secret special projects. But it's, it, I, I see it's a broader term than contested election. Yeah, the, the, it, it, what's funny is that the, the old term, when I arrived at S, uh, ISS, it was uh, M&A Edge. Okay, that was the, the product and that handled contested situations. Um, and then uh, it, it, uh, it but, but that name doesn't, it, it's, it's good for if it's a merger, contested merger maybe, it kind of speaks to it, but it doesn't really sound like a proxy fight, right? Uh, uh, it sounds more like a, a, a merger. So the fact that it, they changed the moniker to, you know, special situations, and that way it could be for, you know, contested situation where there'd be a proxy fight, where there'd be a contested merger, uh, and, and so forth, uh, that, that would, that, that's, you know, that, that's kind of the, just a, a change in name. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, it's the, you know, maybe it's a, the, the same wine with a different label, if you will. Yeah. So, Herkita, are companies able to review the research reports prior to them being circulated to clients that ISS produces? Is there a, an opportunity to, to correct or persuade? Well, in the past, S&P 500 companies could sign up to receive draft, draft copies of ISS reports. Other companies did not have that opportunity. A little more than a week ago, ISS announced that it would be discontinuing this practice and that it would no longer provide draft reports to S&P 500 companies prior to their publication for the shareholder meeting starting January 1st, 2021. So now no company can review ISS reports prior to the publication. Now, in another year or so, the CC's new rules will effectively require proxy advisors to provide copies of their reports to companies at the same time that those reports are being provided to proxy advisors' clients. And proxy advisors will also be required to ensure that their clients are made aware of any written responses that companies have to proxy advisors' advice. Then again, this is not applicable to the 2021 proxy season. And we also need to see how ISS's litigation with this the CC will play out. 
in the meantime, companies should make sure that they take advantage of the data verification portals that ISS has available. These portals can be used to provide peer group updates, to confirm equity plan information if the company has an equity plan proposal on its agenda. They can also be used to verify board governance and compensation data for ISS quality score. Glass Lewis similarly does not provide draft copies of its full reports to companies before they release to Glass Lewis's clients. Now, majority of the companies have an opportunity to sign up to receive a data version only of their report free of charge before publication. These data reports include the key data points that Glass Lewis uses to formulate its analysis such as information about the company's board of directors, auditors, governing policies, equity plan, data on compensation. They don't include Glass Lewis's analysis or its voting recommendations. The program, you may have heard, the program is called the Issue Data Report Program, IDR. It was launched in 2015 and Glass Lewis reports that in 2020, approximately 700 US companies use the program. It's only available for routine annual meetings. It's not available for special meetings or any meetings that involve merger proposals, proxy fights, or similar matters. A company that would like to receive a data report should file its proxy statement at least 30 days before the shareholders meeting. Then companies that sign up receive an email three to four weeks before the shareholders meeting with a copy of their data report and instructions for providing feedback. And from that point, companies have 48 hours to review the data and to decide whether or not they would like to request any updates. And the corrections and the requested changes have to be made based on publicly available data. And it's up to the company to direct Glass Lewis to SEC filings, press releases, or other publicly available information. Glass Lewis analysts then review the company's responses and if it agrees that we are supported by publicly available information, it will actually fix these mistakes or make updates before the report is issued. Then Glass Lewis's final report is available for purchase. That's a report that includes Glass Lewis's analysis and voting recommendations. Glass Lewis does not provide its final reports for free. Yeah, 48 hours is not a long window when you're a very busy period of time for people that are working on proxy season matters, but uh, I mean, that's the best that that can be done. And companies have been doing it for a while, but I always feel, you know, I've always been glad that I've not been in house during this period of time when there's been this short turnaround, not to have the opportunity to verify. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's important to spend some time beforehand too, sort of knowing what the key questions are and what the key responses would be. So then, so that during those 48 hours, you're not looking at everything fresh. You're actually just reviewing and confirming that the information matches what you think it should say. And then Jim, can companies take the information they get that needs to be reviewed and share with outside advisors to get their input? Is that allowed before uh, a proxy advisor issues its final report? Let me, let me answer this question like it was up until 10 days ago. <laughs> and, then I'll, and then I'll walk through, as, you, as uh, Yogita mentioned, there's been a, uh, ISS recently announced uh, on November 2nd that it had done an about face on the, on the draft for the S&P 500s, okay? And so, uh, uh, so I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll summarize what's been the case all the way through this year for, I don't know, the last 30 years or so or whatever. Uh, and certainly all the time I was there, uh, and, then, and, then, um, and then what it's going to be like when, and, and tack on to a few things that, to what you read, as I said, uh, on what's going to be like as of January 1st. So, so up until about 10 days ago, S&P 500 companies, the short answer to your question was yes. For as long as I can remember, uh, including the most recent year, that they received a draft report, they meaning the S&P 500 companies, okay? That said, 
the company and its representatives were restricted from sharing or disseminating the draft reports uh, as those reports were really for, for fact-checking purposes, right? Uh, in, in certain situations, um, depending upon the, the proximity of the meeting date to the proxy, which I think I discussed briefly uh, a few minutes ago, or, or if the S&P 500, uh, 500 company did not request a draft report, you know, they didn't need it, very few of those, but sometimes that happened. Uh, ISS would not send that company a draft report. Okay, so now, fast forwarding to 10 days ago, uh, as of uh, meetings that are on January 1st of 2021, uh, they informed via the, the letter that, that uh, most people saw that, that they no longer provide draft reports to U.S. companies, okay? So the letter cited the reasons for this, and, and, and I, I frankly agree with a lot of these reasons as being having you know, been in that draft process, but, but here's the reasons that they cited. Uh, I'll, I'll summarize them. It's the, 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 uh, the, the, um, it's one of, the main, one of the main reasons is the increased accuracy of the data they cite. They say that you've gotten better as a data gathering company, and, and as you know, the ISS was, was uh, acquired twice. I mean, uh, it was, they were acquired uh, two or three times when I was there. And so the, in the last two have been private equity firms. And, and one of the private equity firms is, is very, uh, it, you know, data, you know, centric. And, and, and uh, so the, the, the methodology for them capturing the data is greatly improved. And so it, it has resulted in increased accuracy. The second reason is they say that many of the institutional clients that they uh, made it clear to them, they do not support the draft previews. Okay, uh, and this happened more recently through the letters that were submitted to the comment during the SEC's recent rulemaking process. Um, the draft review process, the third reason is it, they, it was not really in the latest uh, uh, years uh, being used by companies as intended. It, it, it had morphed into a try to change the policy or the vote rack instead of a fact checking, not with a, a lot of the companies, but with some. So that's the third reason they they uh, they cited, and then the and one of the most important reasons uh, is that um, it will improve for ISS the the research delivery times to its clients. The draft review with the two days it as often was five days because if you if you sent out the draft on a Friday there is the weekend and then Monday Tuesday and you get the report then you have to see the changes and it would actually um, that would actually make a five calendar day. Uh, a delay, and um, in, in, as you know, for for ISS and Class Two, their clients want the the reports so that they can um, they can do their stuff and say if they agree or not, and do their own analysis, and they can reach out to their uh, to institutions that they need and, and get clarifications and so forth. So they need timing is everything in that process, and the later delivery time, especially as the season. As the season progresses, it gets harder and harder to meet that. It's just that's the nature of proxy season. There's all these meetings, the majority, vast majority of which occur between a window that starts about in in you know late March and it goes through you know roughly June. Um, so that's the reasons. I agree with uh, with 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 those reasons. I did see that happening during my tenure there. That that ended at about two years ago, a little little less than that. And, but as uh, your Gita stated earlier, ISS was clear to note in their, in their letter that companies can still access copies of the final report at no cost and will have the opportunity to provide feedback to ISS at that time. Now, uh, now what, what, what happens if there is a, a problem? Well, to the extent that new information comes to light or errors uh, are uh, identified, there is an alert process and I think a lot of people are, are maybe familiar with that that, are, that are, are listening in. But if you're not, it's basically a, a, um, uh, a way for the, the proxy uh, advisors to, to update a report and, and send out an alert. Now, the alerts, most of the alerts are informational. They may be that they, the, uh, the meeting has been uh, uh, postponed. It, it, there may be, there, there are no vote rec changes, what I'm trying to say. They don't result in a vote rec change, but sometimes they can, and that will those alerts can be used to, to say that you know based on a, a recent filing since the date we published the report, 
this has come to light and or that the company has mitigated a, a, a problem that was that drove the, the negative or the adverse vote rack and they've you know provided that solution so they'll they can um, you know flip the recommendation so so that's the alert process and they would and that's that's always been in place that won't change and so ISS and glass fluid di di distribute um, alerts to all their subscribers who receive the original report to which you know an alert you know relates so and and lastly the letter makes it clear that even when uh, where a client has already executed eight vote instructions for a meeting, they can change those, their votes can be changed in most cases um, uh, in the US as, as late as the night uh, of the, before the shareholder meeting. Uh, so if an alert occurs or there's new information that's salient and it's, uh, it, it, will, uh, it, it could result in a, a, a change, uh, then the, uh, they will be able to do that in a timely way. So. So uh, I don't think that the, the, the draft process for the S&P 500 companies and the lack of that, given that they can see the, the data as Javita mentioned and, and given the alert process, and, and uh, I don't think it, it's, it's as big uh, uh, a, a big a deal as, especially since that through the years, the S&P 500 companies uh, uh, have been, you know, uh, there hasn't been a lot of, of material, uh, you know, uh, error inaccuracies. Uh, there's, there's sometimes the, the occasional, uh, you know, data change or something on, on, um, uh, you know, but they're not really vote vote uh, drivers. So um, that's that's basically what I know on that. So. And these are and these are really the same arguments that the tax advisors made during the SEC's rulemaking process, because the original proxy advisor rules would have required proxy advisors to provide their draft reports to companies. And there would have been a process for companies to provide feedback before the final reports are issued. Now, the final rules only requires that the companies are provided, are provided reports at the same time that proxy advisors' clients receive them. The draft preview process has been eliminated. And Herkita, what about after the report has been issued by a proxy advisor? Is there, how do companies handle correcting an error and something like that? That's a good question. Like, bef like we talked before, ISS has data verification portals and Glass Lewis has data a report process. Now, after the reports are published, both proxy advisors have a mechanism for fixing factual errors. So for ISS, for example, you can go to ISS Help Center on its website, create an account, and then report an error that way. The CC, ISS takes a look at what the company submitted, and then if it agrees that the error is material, it will issue an alert to its clients, and then may also reissue the report depending on the significance and materiality. And Jim has talked about that process a, a little bit. You know, some of the common errors that we still see are mistakes in director's biographical information, such as the number of outside boards that the director serves director independent classifications and also mistakes and compensation data. Also, as you mentioned, once the final report is out, every company can and should request a copy of final ISS report. It can be done online and it's free of charge and every, every company should review it, at least every company that has institutional investors and shareholders base. Glass Lewis also has a mechanism for fixing factual errors. The process is straightforward. There is a report and error button on Glass Lewis's website. In our experience, Glass Lewis will fix any factual error without regard to its significance and then will reissue its report. The mechanism only applies to factual errors. It does not apply to policy interpretations, but the process is fast. It usually only takes 24 to 48 hours after the company's online submission for Glass-Lewis to fix the error and to reissue its report. 
all requests for corrections have to be based on publicly available information. Once the final report is issued, companies have an option to purchase that report. Now, as part of that package at no additional cost, Glass-Lewis now provides report feedback statement service. It's a relatively new feature that was piloted in 2019 and became available in 2020. It gives, it gives an opportunity to companies as well as to shareholder proponents and dissident shareholders to review Glass-Lewis search and then to have their unedited statements included directly in Glass-Lewis report. The program is available for all shareholder meetings. It's available for special meetings as well as annual meetings involving m and activity or proxy fights. A company has, the deadline for company's feedback is seven days after the Glass Lewis's final report is published and at least 14 days before the shareholders meeting. In, investors are, are then notified when the company's feedback is available and has been added to the report. Now, if any factual errors are identified in this process, Glass Lewis will fix them and will reissue the report with a note describing the changes. It's, it's important for companies to review the proxy advisors' reports because many institutional investors heavily rely on them in voting their shares. Of course, the difficulty is that when mistakes are not identified until after the report is issued, there is no certainty that the report will be reissued or that investors will review these updates before they vote their shares. But in any case, even if mistakes are not found until after the shareholders meeting, I think it's still worth taking the time to fix them so that they're not repeated in future reports. And to get that information out into the public domain, companies can file additional soliciting material. You know, they don't necessarily need to file a press release or anything like that, but that's a way for companies to get the information out there if a proxy advisor needs to rely on it. And also as a mechanism, if they just disagree with a recommendation from a proxy advisor, that would subject for a whole other vid guide. Uh, but there's always that avenue for companies to use to make another filing with the SEC. Absolutely, and very important avenue. And the sooner the company can review the reports, sometimes, sometimes you can look at what decisions the company made, compensation decisions, what feedback you had from institutional investors during the say and pay engagement, and you can sort of predict what issues are likely to come up. So some of these supplemental materials can frankly be pre-drafted. There, there's also a um, kind of a, uh, a mistake, and I've learned since I've been away from ISS, there's this mistake that, wow, what I, ISS sends out this rec and all these people follow it. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a recommendation, and, and most of ISS clients have custom policies, and, and those custom policies are, can be stricter or more lenient or can be the same, but they, they, the large institutions that, that have way, way heavily now on, on the, uh, on the vote process, uh, just, you know, with the, with the way the funds have gone and, uh, and, and so forth, uh, the size, uh, they have their own policies. It's not, it's not the, the, the issue of yesteryear when, when it was, when they maybe didn't and they, and they kind of like, relied on that, you know, as their data. In fact, they have a fiduciary responsibility to do their own uh, research and use different sources. A lot of them use both Glass Lewis and ISS and, and they have their own teams as well. Now, granted, a lot of the smaller companies uh, or the smaller um, in, in investors uh, in, in things and certainly the retail group, you know, don't have access, but for ISS clients and Glass Lewis clients, which tend to be the larger institutions and, and you know, in, in, in various degrees, uh, they do have a lot of their own uh, custom policies now, which is uh, which is quite a change from from the in the, over the last you know ten years. And to add to that, I think we should mention that not all companies have shareholder base that follows ISS or Glass Lewis. I mean, there is a fair number of smaller companies that are largely held by retail shareholders 
or that might be controlled by one, two, or three large shareholders. And for them, my SS and gloss loose policies are much, much less important, if, frankly, if at all. So I should mention I have a separate vid guide about six mistakes that companies make when communicating with ISS. You might want to check that out. I want to thank you, Hergita and Jim. That was very informative. I learned some new things for sure and some hot breaking developments just in time for making this vid guide. Thank you very much. Well, Brock, thanks so much for having us here. Yeah, Brock, thanks. Uh, and Jurgita, thanks. It's always great to uh, it's always great to talk to you as well. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.